Today we are moving on from our highest level of homicide murder uh, to the lower levels which fall under this umbrella of manslaughter. Uh, manslaughter, like murder, involves the same act requirements causing the death of another, so all those same considerations apply, but we're seeing again mens rea is differentiating our different levels here. Um, our slide, although literally true, uh, shows that there is a, a darkness to any discussion at murder, and sometimes there's a little levity uh, can help, uh, um, you know, deal with this, because uh, both of our cases today are tragic, but particularly the second case involving the death of a child is often, you know, very difficult to read through and think about. Um, so, yeah, I'm not uh, in any way, by including the slide, attempting to belittle or mock um, the, the crime, but to recognize that this is a difficult thing, and, and a lot of what we're doing uh, through the rest of this chapter and our next chapter is looking at some of the ugliest aspects of humanity and the awful things uh, that we do to each other. So within this umbrella of manslaughter, we have two different categories. Um, one goes by the label voluntary manslaughter, um, and this is the label we'll use for both uh, the common law and the MPC. I mean, the MPC might I uh, use a little little different languages, but the, I'll tell you the concepts are the same and where the MPC differentiates itself. It, it has to do with the provocation test. Um, so voluntary manslaughter is another instance this semester where we use the word voluntary in a totally different way. And here I largely just want you to ignore it. I mean, what voluntary really means here is it's intentional um, uh, homicides, but we're calling them manslaughter. Right, which is itself strange because we associate intentional homicides with murder, either first or second degree or just the category of murder under the MPC. Uh, but in this situation, we're saying the, the homicide was intentional, but because of unique mens rea circumstances, the defendant should be guilty of a lesser crime. Um, under the common law, we call these unique uh, circumstances uh, a heat of passion. Right, that's the typical phrase, although there's other labels here, and some have incorporated the MPC language. Um, the MPC uses more technical terms, uh, extreme mental or emotional disturbance. Uh, but it doesn't define any more precision in, in just using those labels. They both are getting at the same basic concept. So common law jurisdictions vary in uh, their approach. Uh, they can incorporate one of three elements into uh, their uh, test for whether or not somebody is considered to be adequately provoked such that their uh, intentional homicide, which would normally be considered murder, should be reduced to manslaughter. And those are the subjective, objective tests, and then the third part is a legally adequate baseline. And so the text goes through this sort of quickly, uh, just to, to give you the basics here. Um, so the subjective test is, was the person subjectively in a heat of passion? Or in the case of the MPC, as we'll talk about extreme emotional disturbance, so we'll use those terms interchangeably. The second is, would a reasonable person in these same circumstances uh, be in a heat of passion? The third is where things, uh, you know, get a little different. Certainly this is the biggest and, and, and significant difference between the manslaughter doctrines of the common law tradition jurisdictions and the MPC jurisdictions. So legally adequate baseline means that certain things will automatically be sufficient to prove provocation and possibly certain things will automatically be considered to be inadequate uh, alone uh, to form provocation. So jurisdictions can vary on what's in these, uh, you know, uh, legally adequate and legally inadequate lists. Uh, but the most famous example and one that's still used is the Ashworth categories that were created by Lord Ashworth. And so, uh, you know, we start uh, by the things that are legally recognized. Angry words followed by an assault, meaning there's actual physical battery or a threat of a battery. Um, this is not mere words, as we'll say, words alone, which is legally inadequate. That starts off our other list. It has to include a threat of violence or actual violence. Well, you might ask yourself, well, why isn't this just self-defense then? And we will get to self-defense and defense of others in our affirmative defense. The key here is uh, it's not um, sufficient assault or battery uh, to, to justify um, a murder, right? So if somebody pushes you or punches you, that's an assault or battery, uh, but we don't, you don't get to pull a gun out and kill them. Uh, we're going to talk about the proportionality idea of self-defense. And so we mean angry words followed by an assault that does not rise to the level of justifying self-defense. 
the sight of a friend or relative being beaten. So if you happen upon a scene, again, the beating can, you know, is not at a sufficient level that it would justify defense of others, which is, you know, tied into the self-defense doctrine. Um, interestingly, it's limited to friends or relatives. It's not just strangers, but that's the way the category was written by Lord Ashworth. The third is the sight of a citizen being unlawfully deprived of liberty, uh, meaning that they are being restrained or detained in some way. But it's important to recognize unlawful here. So you can't intervene when the police arrest somebody by uh, killing the police officer. That is not considered to be an unlawful deprivation of liberty. But other restraints can justify it. Again, not so much that it rises to the level to justify self-defense and defense of others. And so all these first three categories, they're, they're pretty similar, right? They're relying on these, um, you know, attacks or restraints on a person, be it the, the defendant or a friend or relative. But then we get to this fourth category, adultery. And, you know, like the old Sesame Street saying, one of these things is not like the other. One of these things does not belong. And this is certainly an important one in our, our first case. So I'm going to save the extensive discussion of adultery's role here until we get into uh, um, that fact pattern in that case. And then Lord Ashworth also defined five things uh, that were not legally adequate alone to establish uh, provocation. Uh, words alone, so, you know, sort of sticks and stones, they break bones, but words will never hurt me, is, is embedded in this provocation rule, such that if a person, you know, is, even if there's horrible things said about them, um, slurs uh, of their identity, um, horrible things about their family and mother, none of that can justify, under the Ashworth categories, a provocation instruction, such that they can get a reduction down to voluntary manslaughter unless it's not really words. The, the first case refers to this as informational um, uh, communication uh, or informational provocation, meaning that a threat, although words, uh, is sufficient to put us up in that angry words followed by assault because the assault is uh, a part of those angry words. It's a threat. Um, so yeah, it's not just the, the fact that it's verbal or nonverbal communication. It's that the words can be insulting, they can be derogatory, they can be offensive, and under the Lord Jatworth categories, that does not give rise to a provocation instruction. But if it crosses over into a genuine threat, uh, that is something different. Affronting gestures is just the nonverbal form of words alone. So those two are interchangeable. One's verbal, one's nonverbal. Um, trespass to property. I know um, that you've probably seen signs in some parts of the country uh, where you come from, where you've been, that you know they sell like, trespassers will be shot. Uh, note the law does not work that way. Uh, you do not get to argue a voluntary uh, uh, manslaughter instruction for mere trespass. Now, an invasion of the home is different, and we will talk about that in self-defense. So we're just talking about somebody stepping on your lawn or your fields or private property. Um, you do not get a voluntary instruction merely by the trespass. It has to be something else. Misconduct by a child or servant. Uh, yes, this shows the antiquated nature of the rules, right? So um, this had to be said, uh, right, that child children or servants could not be killed and you would get a reduction in your uh, charge to voluntary manslaughter, which would, you know, be a much less penalty and, and punishment associated with it. Uh, now, the fair, mere fact that a servant or child um, committed some wrong, uh, it does not um, allow you an escape hatch from a murder conviction, even under Lord Ashworth's category. You'll notice, of course, that slaves are missing from here, and certainly this was a salient uh, possibility at the time Lord Ashworth crafted his categories, and that's because slaves were largely viewed as property, and so killing one um, would not be a crime at all um, at, at that time. It is interesting in the U.S. that even when slavery was legal, some cities did criminalize murdering your slaves, but not as murder is something else. Um, and there were some famous trials in this area, particularly in New Orleans, um, for torturing and killing slaves. But for the most part, it was uh, legal. And so it's a, you know, that omission here from that list of child or servant is itself notable. It's not saying that, you know, those operate in a way that's different under the manslaughter. No, it's just not a homicide at all. It, because uh, people who were slaves were, were considered to be property. Um, thankfully, it's no longer the rule. Uh, breach of contract. Yes, so you're, you know, I'm sure you learn in your contract disputes that some breaches cause hostility, anger, you know, uh, a sense that you've been wronged or taken advantage of. But again, that does not, under the Ashworth categories, result in a reduction to manslaughter from murder.
So the MPC differs from the common law by leaving out that third part, the legally adequate baseline, meaning there is no regard for the Ashworth categories or any other version of these sort of laundry lists of things that are adequate and things that are not. So the MPC, you just look at subjectively, was the person in a heat of passion, or we would use the phrase extreme or mental emotional disturbance, um, and would a reasonable person. So technically that means um, some of the things that are uh, in the Ashworth list of not being sufficient, say words alone, could at least go to the jury in an MPC jurisdiction, meaning, you know, words alone, a judge would have a discretion to say, well, maybe these levels of, of words, the, the, the slurs, the personal connection to some of the insults, at least they'll put it to the jury and the jurors can decide, would a reasonable person uh, in that circumstances be in an extreme emotional disturbance such that they could kill a person? Um, but, uh, you know, there's, there's discretion also the other way. The judge doesn't necessarily have to say and say, even though the Ashworth categories aren't in play here, words alone should never be sufficient for a reasonable person uh, to uh, get this reduction. Uh, so the big difference, or the only real difference in our provocation test is that the legally adequate baseline is incorporated into some common law jurisdictions, because common law jurisdictions vary in their approaches, uh, but it's never part of the MPC test for provocation. So provocation is this tool we use to separate when voluntary manslaughter should apply or uh, a murder conviction should be upheld. There is also a doctrine that sort of mirrors this about cooling down that I don't think is worth getting into because it rarely comes up, and so I don't want to, you know, um, uh, elaborate more that there are some cases in the area, um, but it basically is just a mirror to provocation, which is at some point we assume a reasonable person and a, a subjectively a person will lose their heat of passion, and that's going to be very fact specific, and it's not something for you to worry about. But I just mentioned that it does exist, uh, so you don't become in a heat of passion permanently because you were you were wronged or or one of these things happened. At some point, it does dissipate, and that will be very much based on a case-by-case -case situation. Okay, so we have um, a second category of manslaughter that's far simpler, right? Voluntary manslaughter is our com complex one. It sort of sits out there in its own little universe because it's basically saying you have all the mens rea to murder, but uh, we're going to reduce uh, your culpability because of these other circumstances. Involuntary manslaughter, for our purposes, in both the common law and the MPC, we're just going to call reckless homicide. So uh, there is, again, some variation in the real world. And, of course, recklessness is not a well-defined concept in lots of common law jurisdictions. But for our purposes, and actually reflecting the reality, we're just going to use the MPC jurisdiction definition for all involuntary manslaughter, meaning that these are homicides where a person took a substantial and unjustified risk, and they grossly deviated from the conduct of a reasonable person. And our second case will really help to flesh out um, how this works in the manslaughter context. Uh, so let's start with our first case, Michigan v. Young. Um, this puts us squarely in the, the possible uh, voluntary manslaughter case, right? So this is a situation where our defendant undoubtedly uh, meant to kill uh, the victim. Uh, the uh, de victim does a lot to potentially provoke, in a non-legal sense, uh, the uh, uh, defendant here. Um, the defendant has discovered what they believe to be adultery because on uh, the victim's phone there's Kim in these communications. Uh, Reynolds, who is the uh, victim in this case, uh, when asked about Kim, replies in some ways that tend to escalate the situation. He says, bitch, I'm not going to go through this with you. I'm tired of this shit. Uh, he stood in front of Reynolds with the gun in her hand, um, but she hadn't yet pointed it. Reynolds then said something like, bitch, you're, gonna put, uh, you're going to pull a gun on me. You ain't going to shoot me. Uh, Reynolds then pushed the defendant down the bed, and the gun went off. So Ren um, our, our defendant here does claim that it wasn't necessarily intentional, right? There was an accidental shooting, but it, deferring to the jury verdict on that point, uh, we assume that she meant to pull the trigger. Um, also note, you know, this sort of daring somebody to shoot or saying they're not going to shoot often works in the movies and TV shows, right? Oh, you're not going to shoot me. The real world is, is quite different, and, and daring somebody to shoot you is not a wise course. But it doesn't mean the defendant isn't guilty of murder as opposed to manslaughter. So one of the issues we have here is, is this the type of um, uh, conduct by the victim that our law recognizes as adequate provocation? 
So subjectively, I think we can say she's in a heat of passion or extreme emotional disturbance. Would a reasonable person be so? Well, you know, that's a jury question. And, and the problem we have here is it, she doesn't even get the instruction to the jury. They're not presented this opportunity to consider the voluntary manslaughter instruction. And so the majority thinks that was all right. They didn't need to instruct it because the the um, evidence that she's offered, the statements about what happened, just aren't sufficient for a reasonable person to conclude, um, to, or I'm sorry, a reasonable person to be so emotionally disturbed as to commit a homicide. And, um, you know, you'll notice they consider um, the sort of Ashworth-like categories here, and specifically this instance of adultery. And the court sticks to the traditional view that adultery uh, must uh, be among married persons. And since these people who are in a long-term relationship are not technically married, uh, it doesn't apply. And this is, you know, often rigidly applied in ways that, that are kind of alarming because we'll talk about in class whether or not this even makes sense to be a provoking category, right? Adultery is that one thing that is not like the others. Um, but if we're going to have it as a category, why is there an emphasis on marriage? This has a lot of ugly effects. So I'll give you two examples. Uh, one is, of course, until very recently, people who were in long-term same-sex relations uh, were not allowed to get married, which means they were never afforded the opportunity of arguing for a voluntary manslaughter instruction in relationships that could last decades uh, simply because they were legally barred from marriage. Um, that's not necessarily one of the things you think about the right to marriage including, but yeah, I mean, technically under this, it's the right to get a voluntary manslaughter instruction if you kill your significant other who you're married to. So that's one effect that it, you know, for people that were, um, our law did not acknowledge the right to marry, um, they also uh, suffer greater criminal penalties in, the, in identical cases uh, to uh, heterosexual couples that were married, but because they couldn't get married, they would be found guilty of murder without the voluntary manslaughter instruction. A second way is adultery is, is often defined in ways that are distressingly limited. Um, so there was a case in Illinois probably about 15 years ago now uh, where um, a man who was uh, married to a woman um, did get into a heat of passion because he discovered uh, or, you know, and, and the woman told him that she had been raped by another man. And our defendant in this case, who was married to the rape victim, uh, grabbed a weapon and went and killed uh, the rapist and asked for a voluntary manslaughter instruction by saying, you know, I was in a heat of passion. A reasonable person might have been in a heat of passion. The jurors should get to decide that. And the Illinois court held no. Because the rape was non-consensual, it wasn't technically adultery. And so we get this oddity that had she had an affair um, that was consensual and willing, our defendant would have potentially gotten a much lower sentence and would have been able to argue that it was only manslaughter. But because she'd been raped, which many of us would consider something that could inflame us more, um, that could uh, send us in a rage more than, say, adultery, uh, the defendant was denied um, this. You might say, well, why wasn't this a situation where there was an assault or a battery? Well, that had already happened in the past. There wasn't an ongoing uh, threat or continuation of a denial of her liberty or uh, assault or battery. And so this was the court viewed a form of revenge, um, which may be appropriate. But again, if you're going to have adultery as a category, its effects are strange, right? Because some people can't even take advantage of it because they can't get married. And other people um, um, can, you know, uh, are denied it in cases that seem far more provoking and severe. Uh, so, yeah, this inclusion of adultery we'll talk about more in class and, and how it works. But um, the majority here says that because they're not married, it's not even a colorable argument for um, uh, voluntary manslaughter instruction. Uh, the dissent says, well, we actually never really said that in the court, and there's no reason we shouldn't at least allow it for long-term relationships, right? It can be a jury question. And adultery, you know, just, you know, some people can get married after a week together and suddenly you get this instruction. Other people can be together for a decade and never get the instruction. So there's a seeming arbitrariness to this limit and focus on marriage here. And so ultimately our dissent says we should include it 
for possibility, but also thinks there's enough evidence in here in general because, um, you know, the defendant had learned uh, that her boyfriend uh, was not only cheating on her, and they'd been together for four years, uh, but that, you know, he had made another woman pregnant, and that potentially could be more um, uh, provoking uh, than just, say, an, an, a normal um, or typical um, uh, sort of provoking adultery event. And so, yeah, this shows sort of how the, the legally adequate baseline, even in cases where it's not technically built into the law, can still have enormous force in deciding the scope of a reasonable person's uh, provocation. And so, yeah, Michigan v. Young sort of has this, this rigid idea in mind about what can be a provoking event, and so the jurors never got to hear the instruction at all. Okay. Whoops, I went to the slides today that actually have questions. We'll deal with those in class. So I picked the wrong slide set. Um, so we'll just fast forward through those and now go to uh, New York v. Louis. So I mentioned this is, you know, a, a tragic case. And, and any homicide is, is awful. But a homicide of an infant uh, is, you know, particularly uh, distressing because Colby Bullock here is, is eight months old and has already suffered a, a decent amount of child abuse. But the question here is the criminal culpability, not of um, the person who directly abused Colby, uh, but in fact the mother of Colby, because uh, she is living uh, with Michael Flint, uh, who is, uh, you know, in charge of taking care of Colby. And she has known that Flint has, you know, shown violent tendencies. Um, some of them were directed to animals. He kicked and killed a kitten, but also at Colby specifically. It's not clear to me the discussion of the animals are really uh, significant here. Um, and so the question is, well, there's two questions because there's two crimes. And it's the fact that there are two crimes that make this a really good teaching case, even though it's disturbing to read. On the one hand, we're looking at is our defendant guilty of involuntary manslaughter, meaning did she... Uh, you know, cause a reckless homicide where Michael Flint kills Colby through his conduct, but she uh, enabled that by taking the substantial and unjustified risk that she was aware of, according to the government and according to the court here, uh, the majority anyway. Uh, yeah, she did take that risk, and it was a gross deviation from a reasonable uh, person. Um, and so, yeah, that's one of the crimes. But the other crime is helpful because it's basically an assault and battery version or an endangerment version of second degree murder, um, uh, depraved heart or cold hearted uh, or extreme indifference to human life. And what do I mean by that? Well, it means the mens rea for this reckless endangerment crime is not mere recklessness. It is this reckless endanger, I'm sorry, reckless indifference to the value of human life that we see built into uh, uh, second degree murder. And so what makes this case nice is you get to see the court actually differentiate what we consider to be ordinary recklessness, right? The recklessness that's defined in the MPC and this, what I've referred to as super recklessness, this heightened level of extreme indifference to human life, even though one of the crimes is technically not secondary murder, the, the mens rea analysis is, is pretty much the same here. And so I think it's, it's helpful to see because ultimately the court here decides um, there is adequate mens rea for ordinary recklessness. But there's not for this second degree homicide because it doesn't show an extreme indifference to human life. And so that court discussion there adds to what we talked about Malone last time, right, which talks about, you know, why in that case there was an indifference to human life. Um, and in this case, there is not this extreme indifference. So these two cases are sort of at that, you know, boundary discussion. Um, but there also is a dissent which thinks it's not even clear there's evidence of ordinary recklessness here. At best, it might be negligence. So we see basically three different mens rea levels being discussed in the context of a single crime. And so that's why this case is, is valuable for, for learning, because you get to see how the same facts are viewed differently across these three uh, different levels. And the big difference between the majority and dissent seems to be on that part of the recklessness test where somebody is aware of the risk, right? Because negligence says you should be aware, but you were not actually aware of the risk you were taking that was substantial and unjustified. And the, the facts here are tough because it's clear that our, def our defendant has communicated with friends that she is aware of the child abuse going on. Right? There's no doubt on that. And so you might say, well, okay, well, doesn't that solve the issue? It's open and shut case. She's guilty because she knew about the child abuse. 
But that's not the same thing as knowing there's a risk of death. That's where things uh, diverge between our judges, right? The dissent says, listen, she knew that Colby could be hurt. She knew that abuse could happen. But she did not, there's not direct evidence that she knew death uh, could result. And, you know, at least there could be a reasonable doubt in that. Whereas the majority says, listen, this level of abuse is so significant, and the jurors heard the evidence, they decided there was enough to think that there was a substantial and unjustified risk of death and not just of abuse. And I think both of these views are viable, right? They both look at the same facts and say, you know, where, where the risk profile lay. Um, everyone agrees among all the judges it's not enough to show an extreme difference to human life and perhaps that's because there's only one person Colby at jeopardy here um, or uh, because there is this problem that even the risk uh, of, of injury here doesn't speak to that say shooting into a crowd where the risk of death is, is much higher um, and so at the end of the day you know we see I think very reasoned and um, in-depth discussions of uh, these mens rea uh, and it happens that one of them falls in this separate crime that sort of second degree mens rea but it's the same analysis and the dissent here you know while recognizing that you know this this is a tragedy they're not saying that the defendant shouldn't be guilty of something uh, they just think the more appropriate term would have been negligence right to say that she had taken a substantial and unjustified risk she had grossly deviated from the conduct of a reasonable person but but it didn't rise to uh, um, uh, her awareness of that risk, right? So it only is the case that she should have been aware. And, you know, to that point, the dissent cites that other people knew about this and also didn't take action and, and didn't view it as necessarily uh, life-threatening. Um, it also could be a failure of the system. And the friends here, I mean, I do think the friends' statements are a little, in hindsight, odd, right? If you really thought the risk was this high, uh, they also didn't intervene, but it's also not obvious what they could have done. But the, the lack of social services intervention or other state intervention here does complicate things. And the dissent says the defendant could not know the severity of the abuse of the child, right? She only knew of the sort of um, bruises and injuries. Um, she did not, you know, the, it even said hospital personnel were only able to determine the extent of the internal injuries after multiple x-rays and blood tests. And if that's the case, it would be hard to put a, a lay person seeing bruises which in marks which do indicate abuse, but not necessarily life-threatening abuse. And so this is a case, again, where we see a split on whether we should defer to the jurors, inferences from the facts, or, um, you know, say, well, but they, maybe they, they read a little too much into this, and we should be cautious and, and be too deferential here, given uh, the evidence that was presented. So this is our sort of involuntary manslaughter case, especially when we look at it in combination with the Malone, where we start to differentiate reckless homicide from reckless indifference to human life and the value of human life. And so that's it for our manslaughter cases. Next time we will segue into uh, actual negligent homicide and then in class for that, you know, because we'll have we'll briefly talk about it in the lecture, uh, we'll look at a bunch of review examples that try to cover all of our murder and manslaughter mens rea possibilities. Uh, so that's it for today.